kind of thing that sort of reminds me. I spent two weeks in Germany in 2006 on a mission trip. And of course, in Germany, uh, the main mode of transportation is either trains or bicycles. Not everybody drives. And they told us, when you go to catch the train, it ain't like in America, they're going to give you grace. If it leaves at 12 o'clock, it means at 11.59 and 59 seconds, you better already be on there. The door shut and it departs the station. And uh, the, the Germany has the most on-time train system in the world. And most of us Americans wouldn't do well there at all. Uh, especially some of you Baptists who can't get here until uh, 5 after 11. You'd be left all the time. You'd be hoofing it everywhere. Uh, but anyways, I failed to mention this earlier. Big praying with this mission this morning, I asked the church pray for Brother Tony Michaels. He's the pastor of Jolly Springs Baptist Church at uh, Como. Uh, he was uh, struck yesterday riding his motorcycle. He'd been to a men's breakfast and was leaving and was struck and uh, was airlifted to Vanderbilt and was, he'd lost the feeling in the lower half of his body last night. They found some damage to his spine. They'd done surgery, hoping that was going to take care of it. I got a report this afternoon. They've done the surgery and it doesn't look like he may, there's a possibility he may never gain his, regain his mobility. So remember Brother Tony and his congregation. Uh, during this time, his wife and daughter as well in Vanderbilt. I, I appreciate you, uh, and I know they would too, praying for them. If you got your Bible with you, let's go back to John chapter 7. We pick up in verse 37 tonight. As we continue here with our context, as Jesus has gone into Jerusalem to the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's where we continue with tonight. In 1957, some of you may remember this, but 7-Up advertised their drinks with the slogan, bring on the real thirst quencher. Now, you may like to drink 7-Up, and perhaps you, uh, if you drink 7-Up, it'll temporarily quench your thirst, but I promise you, you'll be thirsty again. In our text tonight, we see that Jesus declares himself here to be the real thirst quencher. Uh, not of a physical thirst, but of a spiritual thirst. Now, the Jewish Feast of Tabernacles, as I said this morning here, this is the context, but in this celebration, I didn't get into all this because it really comes into play tonight. During the celebration, they are celebrating, commemorating their past during this week-long celebration, but also during this time of commemor commemorating their past, they are praying and asking God for rain. Uh, you know, the Middle East, and especially Israel, is a dry land. And so during this celebration, they would uh, pray and ask God for rain. So here, that's the backdrop to Jesus making His great statement. They're in desperate need of, of rain. Kind of like we've been the last few weeks, the farmers around here have really been wanting rain. So you can imagine uh, this, this picture here that we'll see here in just a moment. John says on the last day of the feast, Jesus stands up and makes this great declaration and He cries out and says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now Jesus is the real thirst quencher. You see, He alone can satisfy the deepest thirst of your soul and your heart. He can give you and I living water. Now, as we see here in this seventh chapter, chapter, many of the people, uh, they don't really understand Jesus' statement. They think this guys he's got too hot or something, he's jumping up and saying stuff off the wall. But they don't understand his statement. But many of them would go home still thirsty. They're still missing something deep down inside. Our society today is looking for a real thirst quencher. Maybe it's drugs, alcohol, sex, pornography, success. Whatever it is, our society... Is looking for something to quench the thirst of their soul, and they don't realize that only Jesus Christ is the one who can quench the thirst of the human soul. Now, if we look over this section here tonight, Jesus had more than enough living water to take care of these people, but they would go home unsatisfied. But we find here tonight, you and I don't have to stay thirsty. Listen, Jesus tonight is offering living water to those who have a thirst. He's offering the real thirst quencher to satisfy your thirst here tonight. And, and for that reason tonight, as Jesus offers living water, I say to you, drink deeply and He will satisfy your soul. You see, to drink deeply of Him, we need to understand what it was He was saying in this text 
And why those around here missed it and what you can do tonight to receive this living water if you're thirsty. <laughs> Notice here, let's read together. Uh, John chapter 7, verses 37 through 53, they were going to have prayer. Beginning in verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, this is very important, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth, this is the prophet, the one Moses spoke of. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of Jesus. And some of them would have taken Him, but no man laid hands on Him. Remember this morning we saw the religious leaders already called for security? Told them to go ahead and arrest Him. The temple guards have come and they're going to try to arrest Him, but they don't do it. And notice verse 45. Then came the officers, the officers, the security guards, back to the religious leaders, the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? Listen to what the security guards tell them, verse 46. The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. We've never heard anybody talk like this guy. Then answered the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto him, This is the man we met back in chapter 3. He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went into his own house. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We ask you to bless it. Thank you for this precious statement that Jesus made tonight. We thank you for his truth. We thank you for the offer that he offers to be our real thirst quencher. Father, we pray for thirsty souls tonight. May they come and drink deeply of Jesus. And it's in his name we ask you to bless your word. And amen. I want you to notice three things here with me tonight from our text. First of all, I want you to notice here with me tonight the representations in the words of Jesus. The representation in the words of Jesus. Now, as I said earlier this morning in our text, the, the religious leaders have already called for the temple security to arrest him as he was teaching in the, the temple, and the guards do not arrest him. And when they come back to religious leaders, they say, Hey, why have you brought him to us? Why have you already arrested him? And in their statement there, verse 46, is very powerful in this chapter. They said, never man spoke like this. We've never heard anybody make claims like this man Jesus of Nazareth has made. And what was his claim? Verse 37 was, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So what is it that was so powerful about these words that these security guards refused to do their job? Well, notice here. What, what it is is so powerful about this. I want you to notice here two things in the representation of Jesus' word. Notice, first of all, the context of this statement. I've tried to, to teach you all this along. Context is everything. So let's put this in context. What's, what's the setting here and the backdrop of what Jesus is saying here in verse 37 and 38? Well, Jesus, we find there John says in verse 37, he says, in that last day, that great day of the feast. Now, you and I don't know what that means. John's writers would have knew immediately what John was referring to. Now, this Feast of Tabernacles, this week-long celebration, during this time, every day, there is an elaborate ritual that the priests go through. The priests leave the temple. They take a golden pitcher. They go down to the pool of Siloam and they get a big pitcher of water and, they, and then they have this big uh, uh, procession back to the temple. The people are singing and shouting and praising. And as they come back to the temple, the priest is pouring the water onto the altar and then they're praying and asking God for rain and for water. 
And as they're doing this, the people then, well, while they're going through this process, they will all quote Isaiah 12, 3, which says, Therefore with joy shall we draw water out of the wells of salvation. You get the picture? For seven days now, they've been going through this process. The priests and the people go down to pull us alone. They get a big old pitcher of water. They go through this. They're singing. They're praising. They come all the way back to the synagogue. And on the altar in the temple there, the priest, as he pours out this water, they recite Isaiah, and they're asking God for rain. Now, that's the backdrop for what Jesus is saying here. Now, here's what I want you to see. Do you get the representation here? Here's the thing. These people were asking God to send rain. And while they're asking God to send rain, Jesus pops up and He simply says, I'm the one you need. He, listen, Jesus is saying, you're thirsty. You're in need of water. What you really need is me. I am the real thirst quencher. You're asking God for rain. You're asking God for water. But I am really what you need. You see the backdrop here? The context? They're probably thinking, Who, what does this dude do? Jesus saying, if you're really thirsty, just come to me. You've been down here seven days in a row marching, chanting, shouting, praying, and pouring water out. Well, you don't need to do all that. You need me. This is the context here of this statement. But if we're going to really understand the representation of Jesus' words, we also need to look a little closer at the content of his statement. What did he actually say there? Look there again, verses 37 38. Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So these people were praying for water from heaven, and Jesus plainly said, I'm the one that's going to get the, I'm the one that can supply it. You're looking for water, I'm the source. You see, and not only could he give them a drink, he said, not only can I give you a drink, I can put a source within you where you have a continual supply of water. You see, notice here the content of his statement. Notice who was invited here. I love this. Jesus said, if any man thirst. Who's invited to come get a drink from Jesus? Anybody who's thirsty spiritually. That's what Jesus is saying here. He, he said, anybody with a, spir a spiritual thirst is invited to come to me. I will give you living water and I will quench your thirst. You see, He could quench the thirst of all who came then. And praise God, He could quench the thirst of all who come today. Amen. I love the old hymn, There's Still Room at the Cross. Amen. Think about that. Though millions have come, there's still room for one. Hallelujah. As Jesus has given living water to millions of people throughout the centuries, He still offers living water today. And if you will come, if you're thirsty, Jesus invites you to come tonight. If any man thirst. Who's invited? Any man with a thirst. Notice also what was indicated. Jesus said, If any, any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Jesus was saying that he was the one who could give the living water. He was the one who could satisfy the thirst of the people. You see, no one else had ever claimed such things. Why were these security guards so awestruck? They had never heard anybody make a claim like that. They never heard anybody say, hey, I'm offering you a supply of water and you will never thirst again. You see, they never heard anybody make such a bold statement about themselves and for the record, nobody else could, could they? You see, it's no wonder that the security guards are stopped in their tracks. They never heard anybody make a claim like Jesus did about being a source living water. Secondly, here we've seen the representation in the words of Jesus. Now I want you to see the response of the world to Jesus. How do they respond to His statement? Well, this chapter has got a variety of responses from a variety of people. Uh, you see a mixed bag, if you will, on how people respond to what Jesus just said. Remember, you got the picture? The priests and the people have been going down to the pool from the salon for seven days, getting their picture, marching back, praising, quoting Isaiah 12, 3, praying, dumping the water out. And on the last day, the great day, the big celebration, Jesus jumps up and says, Hey, I'm the one you need. You're looking for water. You're looking for it in me. We find that the 
people have their own opinions. Like noses, right? Everybody's got one. Hope you do. Notice here, we find in this text here that most of them don't know what to do with Jesus. Most of them are like a baby with a diamond. A baby doesn't know what that diamond's worth, and a baby don't know what to do with that diamond. That's the way the world is with Jesus. They don't know what he's worth, and most of the world don't know what to do with him. And notice here three different responses John tells us from the crowd. Notice, first of all, how the individuals responded. How the individuals responded. Verse 43 says, John tells us, so there was division among the people because of him. Everybody had their own opinion. The people were divided about what they thought about Jesus. Some of them said he is the prophet. He's the one Moses told us about. Some of them said that uh, he is the Christ. He's the long awaited Messiah. He's the one we've been looking for. And still others got angry and they wanted to hurt him. So we have this wide variety of opinions of how people respond to Jesus. Don't we have the same thing today? In our world today, everybody's got their own opinion of Jesus. You know, they argue among themselves about who Jesus is. Is He real? And this is my version of Jesus. And this is my version of Jesus. And I, I don't believe Jesus will do this. And I don't listen. They've got their own opinions about Jesus. But the world today doesn't understand that all they've got to do, their opinion doesn't matter. That all they've got to do is simply believe. Jesus just said, hey, if you're thirsty, come and get a drink. You don't have to have an opinion. Just simply believe in Jesus. Come and drink of the living water He offers. We see how the individual responded as a mixed bag. We find in our society today still a mixed bag about who Jesus really is. Secondly, notice how the ignorant responded. Now when some of these people said they thought Jesus might be the Christ, John says they're looking at verse 41. <clears throat> but some said... Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Notice there in verse 42. Then he said, Hath not the Scripture said that Christ cometh out of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? Now, the people was right about the Scriptures. Yes, Micah talks about the Savior being born in Bethlehem. Yes, they were right about what the Scripture said, but they were wrong about Jesus. They were ignorant of who Jesus was. They didn't realize Jesus had indeed been born in Bethlehem. They didn't realize that Jesus indeed was the seed or an heir in the family of David. They were ignorant of those truths, you see. They didn't realize He'd been born in Bethlehem. And still many people today in this world, they think they know about Jesus, but in reality they're ignorant. They don't know who Jesus really is. They don't know Him at all. Listen, listen. can I tell you something as your pastor? Let me warn you tonight. Don't ever watch anything religious on the History Channel or National Geographic. That stuff's best out of hell. It won't be accurate at all. Here's what happens. Our world gets what little religious information they get from the History Channel and the National Geographic or the Science Channel and they go, it must be true because it's on TV. <laughs> oh, what do they call us rednecks? <laughs> Listen, folks, some of you have been in so proper world too long. If it's on TV and Facebook, you don't make it true. You better do your homework. Listen, you know where I get my information? If you don't come out of this right here, I ain't believing it. Amen. The world's ignorant of Jesus because they've got a lot of misinformation. And we find also, even in Jesus' day, people were ignorant of who He really was. Thirdly, we see also how the intellectual responded. At the end of the chapter here, John tells us how the religious leaders responded. They were the educated ones of the day. They had been to rabbinical school and they could they knew all the ins and outs of the scriptures, you know. And when the guards tell them, hey, we've never heard anybody say anything like this, they were hot. Hey, we give you a job. You're supposed to arrest him, have arrested him. Listen to the sarcasm in verse 47. Basically they said, hey, has he fooled you too? talking down to the gods. We are the intellectual superiors. 
See all my degrees on my wall over there. I know more than you do. He's fooled you. <laughs> Talking down arrogantly to the security guards. Then they said, if any of us believed in him, like they're the, they're the, they're the standard. And none of us as religious leaders have believed in Jesus. He must have fooled you. We are the intellectual. We are the elite. We have been trained. And he's fooled you. But notice there in verse 49. They said, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. The religious leaders were intellectual. We're trained. We know it all. These people are ignorant. They don't know the law. They're cursed. They say the common folks don't know any better. Old Nick, old Nick. Verses 50 and 51 there we find. Old Nicodemus makes a good argument. That's what he says there. He says, speaking of the law, does our law judge a man without a fair trial? In other words, hey, does that sound familiar? Used to, listen, it used to be in America you were what? Innocent until proven guilty. It's not that way anymore, is it? All it takes is one accusation and you're ruined. Nicodemus says, hey, doesn't our law require that we have a fair trial before we make a judgment? What he's telling the religious leaders. It's only a fair assessment, isn't it? There's, he's saying, hey, before you make a judgment on Jesus, why don't you give him a fair trial? Notice how they respond. Again, in their arrogance. Verse 52. They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? You Galilean, you ignorant backwoods. Who do you think you are? You're not near as intellectually superior as we are. You must be from Galilee. Search and look for out of Galilee arises no prophet. We've been to school. We know more than you do, Nick. Who you think you are? It can't be Jesus. He's from Galilee. You see the intellectual's response arrogantly speaking down to the people. You know what's happening in our universities today and even in our public schools? The intellectually superior look down on people like us who believe in Jesus. Oh, I am Mr. Ph.D. I am highly educated and trained. I am an intellectual elite. You must be a backwoods religious kook to believe in Jesus in the Bible. Does that sound about right? The intellectually, intellectually superior in our society look down on you and I as being backwards and goofy and weird and strange for believing in Jesus. The secularists today and the academic elite, they dismiss the teachings of the Bible and they claim that Jesus is a myth. That's what the History Channel and the Science Channel and the uh, National Geographic and all them uh, science and all they're trying to do. They just try to discredit the Bible. Why? Because I've been educated. I've been enlightened. About as enlightened as a donkey. <laughs> That's about what some of them are. I'll leave that real <laughs> They think because they have been educated that you and I are ignorant. You see, here's the grace and doctrine. The Apostle Paul says this about our educated intellectual people today who look down on you and I and our, and our Lord and our, uh, and our Bibles. Paul says this in Romans 1.22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became foolish. You see, I believe when you approach the Bible without a bias, that the Bible will prove science, and science will prove the Bible if you approach it without a bias. But so many in our universities and our colleges and even in our public schools that our kids are being taught with a bias, and they no longer approach it fairly. You see, the Son of God has offered a thirsty world the water of life and they responded as if He was offering poison. You see, verse 53 says they all went home to their own house. They didn't take Him up on His offer. Listen, friend, if you're going to drink of Jesus and drink deeply, you've got to take Him up on His offer. 
You see, you, there's no need in you and I staying thirsty. We're to come and drink. We shouldn't debate Him. We shouldn't doubt Him. We shouldn't despise Him. We're to drink of Him. How do we do that, preacher? Well, we see the representation in the words of Jesus. He is in the midst of the feast here, the last great day. Is there praying for water and begging for, for rain from heaven? Jesus jumps up and says, I am the one you need. We find here the response of the world to Jesus and finally don't you notice the reception of the work of Jesus. How do I drink of Jesus? Let's look at His words again, verses 37 and 38. Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, he as the Scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Here's the key right here, verse 39. John says, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believed on Him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Now here's the key to receiving living water. Those two things. If you're not going to receive living water, two things are going to happen. First of all, you must receive salvation. You must receive salvation. Now, when Jesus makes this great declaration here at this feast, He's looking ahead in the future. And remember, as we said this morning, when He came to Jerusalem, He already knew eventually on God's timetable He would be arrested, uh, false accusations, a false trial. He would, uh, he would be uh, uh, crucified. He would die. He knew all this was going to happen. And, but He knew that ultimately His crucifixion would lead to His glory as well. And that's what John's getting at here in verse 39. He says, Jesus was not yet glorified. Now, if you're going to going to drink deeply of Jesus and be satisfied, not only do you have to see Him hanging on the cross, dying for your sins as a, as a living water, but you also need to see Him as Him dying for you to give you salvation. You must receive Jesus as your Savior in order to have living water. You must believe that when He died on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead, that His death and resurrection provides you eternal life and salvation that will quench your soul. The only way you can receive the living water of Jesus is to receive salvation. Secondly, you must receive the Spirit as well. Now, we find there, John says in verse 39, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Now here's the thing. The Holy Spirit didn't come until after Jesus ascended into heaven. Acts chapter 2, remember? Now, this is before Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. So Jesus said he would put into the soul of those who would believe his Spirit. And, and, and with that Spirit would come a river of flowing water. In other words, you'd have a supply that would quench your thirst from within, which is the Holy Spirit. He would send the Holy Spirit after He ascended into heaven. Now the people at the feast didn't uh, they, uh, that day, they didn't know this. They weren't, uh, they weren't uh, privy of the truth Jesus told the disciples later in a private meeting in John 15, 26. Jesus said, But when the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. Jesus invites any man, he says, If any man thirsts, to come and drink from Him. And when you believe, He gives us the Holy Spirit who comes to live in every believer. You see, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell here in our hearts. And if you've been saved tonight, Jesus has given you the Holy Spirit. And the same water of life that Jesus gave you when you got saved is a source and a constant supply through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is, is the one who gives us that constant supply within to quench our soul. As the world scrambles looking for something to drink, the Spirit of God keeps us watered all along. You see, when you and I yield our lives to the Holy Spirit, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, which means you're just submitting to the Holy Spirit. The living water of Jesus can water your life. Here's the thing. You can be walking through the driest valley in your life, but the Holy Spirit can keep you watered. That dark time in your life, that troubling time in your life, when everybody else is looking for a cliff to jump off, a pill to swallow, or a gun to shoot yourself with, the Holy Spirit gives you that peace and that water and helps you get through that valley in your life. Amen. You 
You see, we live in a world today that's dry and thirsty. And Jesus stands and says, I am the oasis for your soul. As you're looking for something to drink, I am the source you need. And Jesus offers that oasis to the soul and His Spirit can quench our thirst even as we journey through the deserts of life from time to time. We all know this is basic science that water is vital for physical life. You've got to have it. You've got to have it. But you know what's more vital for you than water for your physical life? It's living water for your soul. Just as you need water to live physically, you need spiritual water from Jesus to live eternally with the Lord in heaven. Tonight I ask you, are you thirsty? Come to the real first quencher, Jesus. For the walk to Miss Kansas, don't come. We're going to have a song of invitation tonight. Jesus died on the cross in our place to pay for our sins and offer us living water. And if you're needed, in need of that living water tonight, I invite you to come. I'll be standing down front. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, I've never made a public profession of faith. I've never made... Know that I, I am saved. Maybe you need to do that tonight and follow the believer's baptism. Or maybe the Lord's leading you to unite this church from a sister church of like faith and order. Whatever it is, the altar's open. If you have needs, you can pray. I'll be glad to pray with you. Whatever your need is tonight, won't you come? Let's drink deeply of the living water as we stand and sing. Whatever, Brother Walter. 107. 107 in the red book.